Welcome wrestling fans worldwide to Knoxville and the Great Smoky Mountains for the Ron Fuller Tennessee Studcast. Six feet nine inches tall, 265 pounds. This historic podcast from one of the most respected and successful wrestlers and promoters will follow the footsteps of one of the largest and oldest wrestling families on the planet. The Tennessee Stud, Ron Fuller. Through 93 years and four generations. The Stud has arrived. Old school or new fan, this unique broadcast will educate and captivate as Ron details decades of professional wrestling's growth with truly unforgettable stories. I want those people out there at home to hear the stud. Sit back and enjoy the ride with the Tennessee stud. The Tennessee stud. You will learn that name. You will remember it. And now, the stud is here. Please welcome the creator of the popular 605 podcast and the president of the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network, your co-host, the great Ryan Last. Hello again, friends, and welcome back for another edition of Ron Fuller's Studcast. I am the great Ryan Last. It's my pleasure to be with you once again as the Tennessee Stud takes us down the road, telling us all about wrestling's greatest wars in the ring and outside the ring. We'll certainly talk about that this week once again as we talk Atlanta and the wrestling wars. Without any further ado, the Tennessee stud himself, Ron Fuller. And Ron, what a reaction we got last week to part one of you talking about the Atlanta wrestling war, maybe the greatest wrestling war of all time. And we're going to go back to it this week. I learned a lot of stuff I never knew last week. I'm going to assume the same will happen this week. Well, uh, I certainly hope so. Uh, you know, I mean, uh, I've done a lot of research, and uh, and it's really pushed me. This this particular uh, program has really set my mind to work, and uh, and I have talked a lot to Bob Armstrong. I talked to uh, Roy Lee Welch. Uh, I've talked to a lot of people that were involved and actually there and experienced in this war, and uh, I hope that uh, I'm relaying the the uh, correct information, but uh, I've certainly done a lot of homework on this, and uh, and I've really enjoyed it. Actually, Brian, I've really had a good time in in and researching this, and and I found out a lot of things I didn't know. And so, you know, I'm thinking today, if we just start out today, uh, maybe the, the 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 good beginning here would uh, let's go back and just pick up a little uh, recap of uh, first part, and. Uh, and that will lead those fans that didn't have the opportunity maybe to hear the first part, which is uh, number 62, and this is number 63. It's obviously the second part of the war, and we should be able to finish the war today. So uh, what I want to do is just go back and, uh, and just kind of bring everybody up to date. Even those that listened to it last week might not mind a little recap here, too. So basically, my family and I moved to Atlanta in 1964. Uh, my father buys out a wrestler there and a and a part owner of the company in Atlanta named Don McIntyre, his 45% interest in the Atlanta territory. He obviously becomes partners with the other major stockholder, which is Ray Gunkel, uh, who owns 45%. And uh, then the promoter and figurehead himself, Paul Jones, been there since 1944, established that company, uh, wrestled there, uh, owned a greater portion of it probably at one time, is down now to 10%. Uh, and uh, the relations between the partners are very good between 64 and about 1970. I don't think there's a lot of problems. Business is just fantastic for them. Growth is just spectacular. Uh, there's a young businessman involved in this story, big time, and uh, and he's a big name, obviously, Ted Turner. Ted Turner has become a huge wrestling fan, and he acquires the uh, UHF television station in Atlanta. Uh, and he has big plans for the development of that television station in conjunction with cable TV, satellite broadcasting. We're talking about a subject in 1964 that very few people on Earth even think have any concept of what we're even talking about and uh so he my father and him become very good friends and and they have this conversation a lot about what cable tv is and what satellite broadcasting is and my father 
begins to recognize the potential uh, and tries to convince Ray the potential of being on this station is just phenomenal if all this stuff comes to pass. Uh, Ted Turner's the type of guy that makes things happen, obviously, and Dad is convinced he's going to do it with this UHF station, and he tries to convince Ray Gunkel, his partner, that uh, they need to be looking at changing television stations to Ted's new UHF station. Uh, big, hard argument to sell to to Ray because uh, the station that they're currently on, Channel 11, is an ABC affiliate. It has a real strong signal. UHF stations are just coming into vogue, and they don't have a signal that goes more than 30, 40 miles out of a city normally. Uh, this is a tremendous decision to have to make. So Dad finally brings Paul Jones on board. Uh, they, as stockholders, vote on it. And and Dad gets r Paul's vote. Whichever one of the two gets Paul's vote, obviously, is going to have their say in the television. I think Paul sees the little future in this as well. He votes along with Dad, and Ray's very upset about it. Uh, and... He's so upset about it that Dad offers him to sell him his, his part of the business. So, you know, I'll get out and if you want to, because Dad really was convinced that, that this is a phenomenal thing that's about to happen in Atlanta, and it would make that territory the premier territory in the world because they will be broadcasting to the world if, uh, if Turner can make this happen with the cable and with the satellite broadcasting of the, pro of the uh, station's product. Uh, so Ray wants no part of the sale. He want, he doesn't want to buy Dad out. Uh, and then I explained in last week's episode, I'm not going to go into the actual explanation again. I want fans, if they haven't heard what happened, Ray kind of sets Dad up for a shoot. And uh, this is this not happened very often. And, uh, and wrestlers don't talk much about this, but Dad did tell my brother this story, and he related to me. I'd never heard it until uh, until a couple of weeks ago, and he tells me about what happened with uh, Vashon coming out of uh, Canada and being a good friend of Ray's, and they almost end up in a shoot, and Dad really gets upset by the fact that his partner would try to do that to him. So Dad gets really upset, and he he, he makes a drastic move, uh, in, in an unheard of move probably the, in what I'm in what I'm in my history. He trades not only the stock that he owns in his Atlanta wrestling company and his farms that he owns in the state of Georgia, and those farms have homes and things on them. He trades them to his uncle Lester, who owns. Uh, stock in the Florida territory, and he has a big ranch down there in Florida, and he has homes on that ranch. They trade everything equally. They trade lives, basically. Dad leaves Georgia, goes to Florida, and Lester Welch comes from Florida and goes to Georgia. And uh, that doesn't work out. Ray doesn't like Lester. He doesn't like Dad, obviously. They're already having problems. Now he doesn't like, Russ, uh, like Lester as well. And uh, uh, Ray, I think at that point when Lester gets saddled on to, on to Ray and Ray's not happy with the relationship he had before, he's less happy with it now. In my opinion, that's where I believe the war for Atlanta uh, actually begins. I think Ray starts to consider a hostile takeover of the territory, and this is in 1972. Uh, before anything goes down, anybody has any idea that Atlanta is going to have this problem. So the relationship with Ray and his new partner, Lester, is very bad. And it just continues to deteriorate. And then uh, Ray makes some moves that I think are, seem to be pretty obvious to me that, that he is starting to try to set up to take over the company. Uh, maybe, I don't know how he plans on getting rid of Lester. Uh, I don't think he has offered to buy him out or that type of thing. But anyway, I believe he starts making those plans. And uh, there's a couple of things that he does here that I that I really believe uh, kind of point to that. And uh, yeah, he, he, uh, he suddenly starts trying to build a relationship with Ted Turner. Now, why would he want to be involved with Ted Turner? He's already voted against being on his station, but now that he sees that they're about to move on to Ted's station, then he starts uh, being friendly with Ted, and uh, and uh, 
why? Why would he do that? I had that thought. Why? And, and it, the only reason I can think of is possibly because he would. He needs, if he's going to do a hostile takeover, he's going to need a television program. And if he gets the television program that the company already has, that's ideal. But if he doesn't, he's going to need one that goes along with the one that's already there. That way there'll be two programs, two programs, two companies that can run. Uh, so... And then another thing that Ray does is he starts wrestling every night. After years of being off and he's out of shape, he's, he starts to wrestle again. Uh, why would he want to do that? He's almost 50 years old. And, and uh, so only reason it could be is because he would, if he's going to, going to try a hostile takeover, if he's going to try to create his own company, he needs to become a star again in his own territory and in his own business. And he can do it again by starting to wrestle again, get himself in shape, get himself over, and he can help this takeover that he may have in mind. This is all postulation by me. You know, I think that, you know, I think that, uh, when I really research this, I find that most people seem to side with the fact that mean Lester took advantage of the poor widow Anne, and that she's a sympathetic figure here, here for for darn sure. But I really believe that when some of the you see the actions that are going on, it kind of makes sense. So he wants to become a star again in his own company. Then he begins to do something that's really strange. And Bob Armstrong talked to me about this. He goes, all of a sudden, Ray is starting to work the cities again, and he's starting to talk to Bob. He's He has for eight years worked his territory, raised territory, and made him a lot of money, and Ray has never liked him, never, hardly ever spoken to him. And now all of a sudden, Ray starts to really be nice to him and complimenting him and tell him what a great talent he is. And, you know, there's another reason that reason that could be is because Bob Armstrong happens to be his top talent in the entire company. So, you know, it, it behooves him if he's got plans to do something and to take a company or to maybe start his own company, he's going to need a guy like Bob Armstrong. So all this is going place, taking place in August 1st of 1972. Ray works the main event in Savannah, Georgia with Oxbaker, and he dies in the dressing room after the match uh, of a heart attack. Uh, a lot of people have written me after listening to the first part about well, what actually happened there and did Ock kill him with the heart punch and all that stuff. Uh, I really don't want to go into that because it's not part of the war. Uh, it's it's a it's a fact that happened and and I, you know that I want to I may I may get get into that at later on, but I'm going to let let that slide for right now. I'm going to focus upon the war itself. Uh, so. His wife, obviously, is going to take over his stock. And uh, and she, at the same time, she's his wife. And if, if he's making plans that are big plans like this, he's going to confide in her. And she knows kind of what may be coming. And this would maybe put an end to it. I mean, you know, if he dies all of a sudden, then uh, maybe it all goes to, to naught. Maybe, uh, you know, but... I think she she really believes that he's maybe headed in the right direction and that they don't get along with their partners and for that she wants Paul Jones out, whatever it may be. Uh, she, I think, is going to pursue what Ray had in mind. Uh, so in September of 1972, he's been he's been uh, gone for a month. And she begins to come to the office. And after she comes, uh, she starts to receive her dividends. She gets paid just like Paul gets paid and like Lester is being paid. They take their dividends. Lester pays her her dividends. Uh, and Lester has a great sympathy for her and, and Ray's unexpected death. Ray, Lester's a good guy, and he feels really horrible that this happens. So she starts coming regularly, making these demands. All of a sudden, she starts saying, well, we need to change this, and we need to change that. And uh, she's even beyond what Ray wanted to change. She, she, she's, and at one point, she goes far enough to say, uh, we need to take Paul Jones' stock and, uh, and reform the company and split that stock between ourselves. And, and because uh, Lester is a reasonable and honest man, he, he says, no, he says, definitely not. You know, uh, so there's growing difficulties between the, 
between the two of them, between Lester and her, just like it was between Ray and Lester. And it's and he offers, like Dad did with Ray, he offers to sell his stock to her or he would buy her stock uh, because it doesn't appear that they're going to get along. Uh, and she says uh, she, she, she won't even talk about it. Uh, she, she just, uh, his answer, basically, that Roy tells me uh, that uh, his answer was from her that, uh, you know, I'm not going to even consider it. So, uh, and, and the reason is that, his, you know, she's probably, uh, she's, she starts seeing Ted Turner. She she starts actually spending a considerable amount of time with Ted Turner. She is a socialite in the Atlanta area and a very recognizable figure. And when she starts dating, or I don't know how close they get, but she starts uh, spending time with Ted Turner. And it makes papers, and it may it's a big story in Atlanta. And and I'm one reason that, you know, maybe she's attracted to Ted Turner. I don't know that. But I, I do know that if she's thinking about a hostile takeover, she's thinking about her own company or whatever, then she's going to have to deal with Ted Turner. She's going to want to get permission uh, to take over her own company's show if it comes to that. And, uh, or if she can't get her own show, she's going to, if she can't take over the existing company, she's going to need her own company. And then she would have to have a show on the wrestling channel, which is now Turner's channel. Uh, it just makes sense that this is part of what the reason that she starts to see Ted Turner. Uh, November 23rd, 1972, uh, Ann calls up Bob Armstrong for the first time ever in, in all the years he's worked in Atlanta. And she asked him to meet her that night at an address that she gives to him on the phone. Bob and I are very close friends, so obviously worked together for many years. They've been partners with Bob. Uh, just uh, what he tells me is truth. Uh, Bob is that type of guy. Uh, he says he goes to the address. Uh, she opens the door, and she welcomes him by saying, Welcome to my office. And he's like shocked. It's a, he said it was the surprise of his life. He's like, what, what do you mean your office? And she says, uh, well, uh, you know, uh, I want to bring you over here tonight because I want to let you know what's about to happen. And she tells him that, that, uh, the next night, uh, on Thanksgiving night, uh, that's an annual wrestling night in Atlanta for many, many years that she is going to have her former company. That's Lester's company. Uh, as their next game match, uh, that that she is going to have her company's first match. And he's like, wow, what in the world are you talking about? And then she says, uh, every wrestler that Lester has, and including Tom Ernesto, his booker, is all going to work for me, and they're all part of of my company. And uh, and then she says that uh, and she says we're going to wrestle in Oglethorpe uh, College Gym. Uh, it, the building is set up. Everything is set up. Nobody knows anything about it, obviously, until the night before. And Bob doesn't know anything about it. Uh, she was probably already met. And I know that they had a meeting. I never talked to anybody about this, but I know that all those wrestlers had a meeting with her and they made a decision to go with her rather than stay with Lester. So, and she offers Bob a $500 guarantee if he'll stay with her and, uh, and keep the top spot. He's one of the top baby faces she has. Uh, and he tells her no. He's the only, only wrestler in all of the group. He and Daryl Cochran, and Daryl Cochran helped train Bob and is a good friend of Bob's, doesn't wrestle very often. Uh, Bob, Daryl doesn't get talk to about this at all but those are the only two wrestlers within lester's group and within paul jones's operation at that point that stay uh that stay with uh, lester and paul jones and uh, uh bob goes home he gets on his phone and he calls lester and he says uh, here's what's going to happen tomorrow night <laughs> i mean that's a pretty horrible situation for a guy right i can't imagine what he went through because it's one thing not wanting to do it, but it's another thing not wanting to do it and knowing that every single person you worked with, just about, <laughs> except for one person who's rarely wrestles, as you said, every single other person, including the booker, will be going with Ann Gunkel. 
It's a very difficult situation. I, I have to stop you, though, and ask you a couple questions, because obviously the story that's been out there for so many years, as you said at the top of the show, was how these horrible people really tried to screw this widow out of what she was due, her, her stock, her money, whatever it may be. That's the story that's always been out there. You're saying right. a lot of things that kind of make you think about that. So I just want to narrow in on a couple of things you said. Ray Gunkel, you know, you said that him and your father were having difficulties. Him and Lester hated each other. I had always heard, and tell me if I'm right or wrong, but Ray actually, beyond you and Robert, Ray seemed to actually have a problem with a lot of people. Didn't Eddie Graham and Ray detest each other? Ray had problems with a lot of people. And uh, Don McIntyre told Dad when he Dad bought his stock, uh, he, he told him that uh, you, you're going to have trouble with Ray. Uh, everybody does. And, and it's horrible to be in business with someone that you can't get along with. So Ray is a fairly unreasonable guy. And, uh, and he not see the, for him not to see the potential and what is about to happen through Ted Turner, uh, just me tells me you got a partner that's not as smart as he ought to be either, because, uh, if this works, this is going to explode wrestling in Atlanta. And that's exactly what happens. It is going to happen just like that. It's just going to make it a monster. So, yeah, I think he had problems with Ray, but Ray had problems with a whole lot of people. And, uh, if you can't get along with somebody and you want to run a company, what do you do? I mean, you, right, you either right. sell your stock if you're a gentleman and you're a, a good person, you sell your stock and you get out and you create your own company. If you want to be a wrestling promoter and you want to run it, uh, then you buy. When Dad offered it to him, when Lester offered him the opportunity, uh, when Lester offer and, offers and the opportunity, there is that opportunity there to say, I can't deal with this anymore. I, I want to do something else or I want to compete with you. Uh, either way, you take that opportunity to get the money. And uh, they didn't take that opportunity. That What happens is they basically just steal the company. They try to steal the company. I think they thought that Lester might just have to walk. He might just say, hey, well, you know, I, they've got all the wrestlers and they've got the booker and, and they've got towns booked and, and you know, it – and Lester's just a fighter. Lester's uh, Lester got the Welch blood in him, and he's not going to just uh, roll over. So I think that's that's what happened. In terms of how the story's always been told, as we're talking about this here, Ray Gunkel had an issue with his former partner, with actually both of his former partners, including your father, and then, of course, with Lester. He had an issue with Eddie Graham, who's the biggest power broker in the NWA in the South or, you know, in that area in general. Eddie Graham is direct pipeline to Sam Mushnick. So, you know, he's going to have a problem with the NWA in, in some way. But it seems like because all the boys went with Ann, he must have had a good relationship in the locker room with the guys that were working there. What is it? I mean, he couldn't get along with the guys at his level or that he was working with as partners. But did the guys in the locker room like Ray? Well, I think a, a lot of them did, and uh, I liked Ray. When I was a kid growing up, uh, I, we moved to Atlanta. I was a sophomore in high school. I spent a lot of time with Ray and Ann at their home on the weekends, and I really liked them. Ray was very nice to me, and it, Ray had a way of, 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 of getting to you, Ray. You know, he could be brusque and, uh, and abrupt, but at the same time, he could be a very pleasant person and a likable person. So I'm thinking if I'm Ray and I'm wanting to take over a company, uh, you, you got to have the wrestlers and you've got to have bookers. I mean, uh, if you can take those product, those people, the wrestlers and the booker, and uh, you can get them on your side, then you've got the ability to, to get the television. You've got the ability to do the, all the, get the, all the other pieces of the puzzle that you have to have to make it work that, uh, it uh, it's a it's a pretty simple deal, and uh, so why did he get nice to Bob? I mean, there's another that's an example. He became extremely friendly to Bob, and he might have been extremely friendly to everybody because he wanted then to persuade them or to influence them to go his direction if he brings this up to them. Well, that's uh, my, that's my question though. Other than 
how mad they would get when he would handle the payoffs before he, you know, began buttering up Bob or whoever else in general, was he liked in the locker room? You know, if you gone back to 1970, did El Mongol get along with Ray? I mean, who did everyone get along with him back then? Or was it something where all of a sudden he was difficult with just certain people? How, how do you see it? I, I, I don't, because I, you know, I, I wasn't a wrestler. Had I been in those dressing rooms back in those years, I probably would have had a lot better idea of what went on behind the scenes. I know that people felt that Ray was a hard guy to deal with. Uh, but if I were in Ray's shoes, I would sure try to change people's perspective of him and, uh, and try to get him on, on his side. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's hard for me to answer something that I don't, I never experienced. I never got to see him in a dressing room, uh, that I can remember, uh, maybe rarely when we, Rob and I started wrestling there in 1970, but Ray and dad weren't wrestling very often. And, uh, I didn't have opportunity to see him in a dressing room. I know that he wasn't well liked by everybody. That's for sure. Uh, there were probably, he did have some friends. I'm sure he did. Uh, so it's difficult for me to answer that question, uh, to be honest with you, because I, I didn't experience those dressing rooms. Well, one last thing that I wanted to ask you, the Butcher Vashon incident that you talked about last week on the show, he was trying to test your father. He was trying, you don't just do that to anyone. You do that if you really want to test someone to see what they could do. Ray obviously has a reputation and a background as being a shooter, as someone who could really handle himself. Was there ever anything with your father and Ray in terms of, not competition, but just boasting about who could do what in terms of shooting? Well, when you talked about shooting, there's a difference. There's a real difference uh, between a guy who is on the Purdue wrestling team and a guy who has been trained by Ed Strangler Lewis. Uh, you know, wrestling, there's two types of wrestling. Jack Briscoe is one of the greatest wrestlers of all time as an amateur. Uh, but Jack did not know a heck of a lot of shooting. And uh, so Ray's background was mostly amateur. Uh, and what you learn in amateur is you learn great moves. You learn to do set outs. You learn to do switches. You learn to do takedowns. You learn to do all those things, but you don't learn what's really important as a shooter. You don't learn how to hurt people. And, uh, you know, Ray, I think was at a real disadvantage. If it came to Ray against dad, uh, I don't think Ray wanted to go there because he knew that dad didn't have all that amateur background, but more importantly, he had that shooter's background. He had been trained by guys that knew how to hurt you and they could train you how to get there and how to get uh, someone in the position to be able to hurt them. And that's where amateurs have a hard time dealing with professional shooters. Well, let's go back to the story here now, Ron. So where we left it, Bob Armstrong had been approached and he went home and he informed Lester about what was happening. Yes. So next night, November 24th, 1972, uh, both Atlanta, uh, both Atlanta Rats wrestling companies. Now they're all of a sudden as two companies have for the first time ever, uh, competing live events on the same night Ann's newly formed all-star wrestling. Uh, she's got a name for it. The whole deal. Uh, has all the wrestlers in the same matches that were advertised on her former company's TV the Saturday before. That is, wow, that's very difficult there. I mean, she went ahead and had Lester's matches on her card. And what she did, yeah, I can imagine that now. She He advertised the card for her uh, as an opposition. And uh, then, you know, she... It just puts him in a really, really bad position. So uh, he and Le then Lester and Paul Jones uh, with Georgia Championship Wrestling, they run on the same night a patched together, substitution filled, last minute card in the Atlanta Auditorium. Can you imagine the fans? Think about this. What about the fans who show up at the Atlanta Auditorium expecting to see a wrestling card that only person there is Bob Armstrong. Uh, wow, it's got to be for fans. I mean, 
wrestling wars are horrible, not just for promoters. They're terrible for the fans, too. And the fans that come to the Atlanta Auditorium that night, they see a mishmash uh, put-together card that uh, guys that are probably just job guys on TV are on top. Uh, it's a horrible thing that Lester presents to his people on this Thanksgiving night spectacular. And she presents his people, <laughs> his card, uh, and his booker uh, figure in the matches. Uh, it's a really, really nasty situation for, for Lester, obviously. And uh, so on, and then, then the following, let's just follow this up on the following Saturday night. Now on this Thursday, uh, the following Saturday, she doesn't have a television. But 10 days later, on December 2nd, 1972, she's on Ted Turner's station, and she has her own show that follows Lester's show. Lester is Georgia Championship Wrestling. It's on at 6 o'clock, and all of a sudden, for the first time ever in history, they follow that wrestling match, that wrestling show with another brand new wrestling show, all South wrestling produced by Ann Gunkel. Uh, it, okay. So I, I'm going to, I'm going to break it really down a little bit for you here. You know, I mean, we, you'd already brought up some of the points here. Uh, it, it, to me, it becomes pretty obvious at this point, uh, that, that she is more, more the responsible for this happening than, than Lester. Because if Lester's offered the opportunity to buy a stock or sell her his stock, and he meant it, I'm sure if he told her that, uh, and she says, no, I'm, I don't want it. And then she ends up with uh, he and Paul Jones. This is not just Lester. This is Paul Jones, too. Been there for many, many years. Well-respected and a great gentleman. Uh, she takes their wrestlers and, and their, their, their booker, uh, their entire business, basically, uh, you don't do that. That stuff doesn't happen by accident. And it also takes a great deal of planning and coordination to start a wrestling company, uh, much less to do a one like this when you're going to slide in there and, and get every, all these wrestlers on board. And all of a sudden you're going to have a, a match that uh, no one knows is going to happen, and you're you're you have it with another guy's wrestlers. It's like the biggest turn that you could possibly get. Uh, to, and and you you in order to start a wrestling company, you have to have television, you have to have wrestlers, you have to have buildings for your events, you have to have a booker. Uh, you really have need a great deal of money if you're going to go into a war like she's about to go into here, and and to to run a first show and, and then have your first TV program within 10 days of that first show, that doesn't happen by accident. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of coordination that takes to get what happens here done. you got to be working on this for a long time and very quietly if you're going to do it uh, behind closed doors. Uh, you have to... You have to uh, coordinating with the owner of a TV station, if she's dealing with Ted and she's trying to talk him into he it, now, if I'm correct about this, uh, she would be saying, okay, uh, then Ted, if you're a good upstanding guy and you want to keep Lester's program, then give me my own show. And that's basically what happens. I don't know if she approaches it that way, but that takes a lot of time. And that doesn't happen overnight. I mean, television stations, uh, they're notorious for not making quick major decisions like that. Uh, she had to start that process months in advance uh, for him to be able to lay the time slot aside, to, to do all the things that a television station has to do to get their stuff to work properly. So... Uh, in order to be successful as a company, you got to have the talent over on your TV. Uh, that takes time as well. If she started her own company and she had brought in her own wrestlers, got on this new television program, it's going to take her at least two or three months to get those wrestlers recognizable to the fans. Uh, so that's going to take a lot of time. It's pretty easy when you're able to take a whole crew and their booker into your company and they're already over uh, then when you start showing them on your tv it's really puts you in the driver's seat uh 
Uh, she had the talent. Uh, Lester would have had. Uh, Lester had to. Lester then has to on his television show the hour before her on the second of December. He has to fill that show with people that they nobody knows, the fans uh, except for Bob Armstrong, and that is a distinct disadvantage when you go to war. And you've got that type of disadvantage. And I happen to know a little bit about this subject. Uh, I had something very similar happen to me. And it's a very, very tough issue and a bad thing to have happened to you when you're trying to compete with your own talent that you have gotten over. So this he's at a really distinct disadvantage here of trying to stay in business very long. Ted Turner is a central figure here because he gives Anne the TV, amongst other reasons. You alluded to it earlier. Obviously, Ted had a relationship of sorts with Anne. He knew Anne from around Atlanta, but he also knew your father. Did anyone from the NWA try to get in touch with Ted? Or probably not the NWA, but did your dad or anyone who would have been working with the office in the past or at that moment trying to help out try to get in touch with Ted and talk to him about this? I'm sure they did. I, I wouldn't doubt that Ted contacted Ted because they had a great relationship. But at this point, it's too late. I mean, Ted has obviously made this decision, and once he once he fires this new second show on TV, he make a fool of himself if he all of a sudden has to jerk that show back off the air after one or two weeks. And he was going to be involved in this war then somehow. It could be lawsuits filed, whatever might happen. I can see Ted saying, you know, hey, uh, buddy, I, I really, really like you and you're a great guy, but, you know, I've made this decision and, and my my uh, my television station uh, uh, is on the line here in some respects and, and I'm going to have to keep doing what I'm doing. So uh, uh, there's a lot of major, there's a lot of elements, major elements, uh, the differences between wrestling wars. Uh, this one progresses uh, in, in, in a most unusual manner. Most of the time when you get a war started, you have both companies that suffer from it. Uh, and, and in this case, there was no great suffering, especially not on her part. She just takes off like gangbusters because she has a new program, and it follows the old program, which is a really great benefit to her because all the wrestling fans that used to watch Georgia Championship Wrestling are sitting there watching that 6 o'clock show, and then all of a sudden, her show comes on. And now when they watch Lester's show, he doesn't have hardly anybody on there for the first couple of Saturdays. He's got a pretty horrible television program here. And then when she comes on, it's everybody they know. They The fans are going, wow, geez, we're going to go buy a ticket over there. Uh, you don't blame them for that. So so it's uh, it's really a really a bad, bad situation that Lester's put in here. And uh and wrestling wars, they're, they're kind of like riots that I talk about in Super, Super Stud Cast number nine. There's no two wrestling wars exactly alike, just like there's no two riots exactly alike. Uh, and now your situation is, is you have a company that's a member of the National Wrestling Alliance, and they're going to get supported by the National Wrestling Alliance against a competing company that has all the talents and the booker of the former company. Uh, both of them have television programs. They're on the same station, uh, and uh, they're back to back. Uh, and uh, there's a the additional added added hour that's been added to the television uh, uh, wrestling, and it's it's for a second company. Uh, it's a tremendous, tremendous, uh, horrible situation uh, for for. Heck, for the fans, uh, for the wrestlers, and that's exactly what wrestling wars are all about. They are horrible for everybody concerned, and this one is just going to get worse. We will return to the wrestling war in Atlanta and the Tennessee Studs' involvement in just a moment. But first, a word about Super Studcast number nine and the rest of the story on wrestling riots. 
Thanks to all the fans around the world, the Studs audience grows with every new Studcast and Super Studcast. He is now considered not just a great storyteller, but by many critics, a true wrestling historian. Please ask your friends and family to ride with the Stud and hear his unique family history and great shows like the Atlanta Wrestling Wars you're now experiencing. And please consider becoming a patron of the remarkable once a month, three hour Super Studcast for only $2.99. This generous support ensures the continuation of all Studcast. The Super Studcast number 9 Rest of the Wrestling Riot Story is now available for all patrons. From all of us here in the Great Smoky Mountains, thanks to everyone who saddles up to ride into history with the Stud. There you hear it. The fantastic Super Studcast number 9 and the rest of the story, Wrestling Riots, available now at patreon.com slash studcast or tnstud.com only $2.99 and we've heard some rave reviews about it we'll have a little bit more about it at the end of the program but let's now get back to the Atlanta wrestling war and what's going on there at this point with the company Ron well obviously you can your your corporation uh Lester's corporation is 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 done I mean it has a partner in it that uh is is supposed to be receiving dividends who now is in uh He's, they're, they're in opposition to you. And uh, so Lester has to reincorporate. He has to incorporate, and he incorporates again under Mid-South Sports Incorporated. Uh, it doesn't have the same stockholders. It has Lester Welch and Paul Jones. Uh, and I don't know if there's anyone else involved at this point. I don't think that uh, that there is anybody else there. And uh, Ann incorporates which she's got to incorporate now. Uh, she incorporates as All South Wrestling Alliance, and I have no idea how her shares are are, are dispensed or who gets what or whatever. Uh, so what's happened now is uh, you've you've got to go and uh, get the lawyers involved, and you've got to restructure, and you've it's a there's just more complications. It's just part of this battle that's just beginning. Uh, and then I come involved. I, I get involved in this uh, on December 9th, 1972. Uh, and the war has just begun. It's it's probably, I guess it's less than two weeks old. And and I get a call. I live in West Palm, and I'm, I'm promoting West Palm for, for Dad and for Eddie Graham. And I get a call from both of them. And they ask me if I will go to Atlanta and wrestle on TV because Lester needs talent. He needs bodies. He needs somebody who's recognizable. I have been there some. So, uh, and then they asked me, they said, would you do us a favor because of your relationship with Ann? And Ann and I had a very good relationship. Uh, always were friendly. I uh, really liked her, respected her. And I think she liked me as well and admired and, and whatever. And, uh, so, they say, would you go and talk to her and see if you can convince her what a mistake she's making by trying to do this war? Uh, so I do. I, I catch my plane. I go in there. I wrestle uh, on the 9th, uh, and then I uh, do TV next day for them. And uh, then that, that Friday night, I make arrangements to meet her, and I meet her at her wrestling office. She says, uh, meet me. She gives me the same address like she did with Bob Armstrong, and I arrive at this at her wrestling office. And uh, so we spend a couple of hours talking, and, and I try to convince her of several different things. Uh, I, try to, I try to explain to her, because I have a concept uh, – of what's going to happen. And, uh, and I talked to dad and Eddie a little bit about it and what, how this war, what do y'all think is going to happen? And so I, I tell her that, uh, that first of all, that she stands to lose a great deal of money of savings. I mean, I don't know what the, that Ray has done. Great. He, he, he probably has a tremendous amount of money set aside. Uh, that's probably not a concern for her, but I mean, if you didn't have the savings to live, and if that was your savings, you plan on living on it, and you wasted in trying to win a big wrestling war that may last for years, uh, what are you going to do after that? Uh, she, I told her that she, she's going to have a huge disadvantage against the NWA. Uh, her talent 
is going to be limited because wrestlers are going to be uncomfortable wrestling for her against the NWA. And, and they all are going to think, how's that going to affect me down the line in the future? Uh, if I go and wrestle for her, um, is the NWA going to blackball me or, or are they going to speak uh, poorly of me or will I have a hard time wrestling for NWA territories after that? So that's a big, that's a big thing for her to, to consider here. Uh, and, uh, then I tried to convince her how difficult it is just to operate a wrestling territory, to, to be sitting in that seat and have all that pressure and, and all the things that you have to do. It's, uh, it's just like, so I spent two hours just basically trying to convince her that, you know, you're just starting here. And then right now you could get out. Maybe they would even bought her out. I don't know. I didn't go that far with them about, would y'all be willing to buy her out? Uh, you know, uh, but she's been wrestling for two weeks. She's been there for two weeks and she's having some success. She gets a pretty good night's crowd in Oglethorpe gym. Uh, then she's going to move into the Atlanta auditorium uh, where the other, where Lester's company is going to be wrestling as well. And she's having some success, and, and she basically, uh, she's gung-ho. I mean, she, you know, there's no talking her out of it. Uh, and so I, I get in my cab, and I, and I go to my hotel that night. Uh, I'm scheduled to wrestle in Australia in less than three weeks, and I'm not going to go back to Atlanta for a year after this. I'm not going to be a part of that war for a year because of my commitment in Australia. And then after Australia, I'm going to start ranking St. Louis. I'm going to work in New York city. I'm going to kind of become a star in this 1973. And I'm not going to see any part of this war for a year, but the war is going on. And uh, let me just kind of explain the NWA's role in this war here. Here's what happens that the NWA is able to do. Uh, Lester's company, Mid-Spouse Sports, it's recognized by the NWA as the Georgia representative. Uh, and, and and this is their first major test for the NWA to support their representative. And they don't back down a bit, Daddy, uh, even though all the members within the NWA do not agree to send wrestlers and lend their support, the NWA itself it starts to do the what they can do to help uh, Lester's situation and to get him talent. So he's without talent, and they begin to immediately funnel him stars into Atlanta on Friday nights. Uh, and that's the wrestling night for Atlanta has been, and it stays that way. Uh, they're going to leave them there on Saturday nights. Uh, that means they'll be able to work television on a Saturday and then work uh, a town for Lester on Saturday night. So the individual members, NWA individual members, uh, they coordinate with the St. Louis headquarters as to who is available. Uh, and it starts taking a couple of weeks for the action to get started. But uh, nearby territories like the Florida, like Florida Territory and the Carolinas and Tennessee, they start sending stars for the weekend. But they also start sending extra talent, people that can help them and, and leave them there. They don't bring them back. Uh, they, there's a commitment going on here from everybody in the NWA that's involved to, to sacrifice, not just uh, they've sacrificed some for themselves because, uh, as an example, Florida sends Mr. Wrestling, Tim Woods, and Johnny Walker, who is going to become Mr. Wrestling too, and, and they send them there for good. They say, guys, uh, pack your bags. We're sending you to Atlanta. Or oh, is there a war going on? And you guys are going to be top figures there. And they do. They produce big money there. They start to really get over and draw. Within a couple of weeks, Lester's putting a, a pretty good permanent crew uh, together, and he's adding top stars from all these NWA territories on his Friday night shows and his Saturday TV. And uh, it's uh, for many months. This thing rolls on and 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 holds her own. In fact, she's doing really well. That's an unusual situation in which both of the the companies are both doing well. And uh, so, what happens to her many months down the road is she's going to have s some 
a staleness of her talent. Uh, she's she's going to have difficulty in getting new wrestlers. I kind of told her that in the meeting I had with her. And, and it's starting to come to pass. And she's sitting there with a crew that's been there for a while with Lester, and she takes over that same crew, and she just keeps running with them. But she's not able to implement new faces, which is extremely important to be successful with a wrestling promotion. you got to keep talent coming. And that talent now is hard for her to find. And, uh, and it's, uh, it's getting more difficult because the NWA is just, uh, he's lighting, they're lighting Lester up. Uh, his crowds are getting bigger and especially in Atlanta because they're sending those guys in there on that Friday and Saturday. And those Atlanta cards are just starting to just get fabulous. Uh, in 1973, early in 73, Bill Watts gets brought in as a booker. And uh, and he probably gets a little bit of stock in Lester's company. Lester now has more stock himself. So Paul Jones, I don't know how they structured that, but I think that Watts comes in there. He gets a little piece of that stock, and Watts is a great booker. He's got a great connections, and he's going to keep improving the talent level, and that's exactly what happens for, for them at that point. Do you think that everything that happened would have happened somewhat the same way if Buddy had not sold the stock or swapped the stock with Lester? Was it inevitable because Ray already had problems with your dad? Of course, he had problems with Lester. He had problems with Paul Jones, especially when Paul Jones sided with your dad. Do you think it was inevitable that this would have happened? I think so. I think it was headed there. Uh, I don't think there was any way to stop it. Uh, uh, and uh, I really believe that, you know, Ray was just the type of guy that he was bullheaded and he just uh, said, you know, if I can't, if I can't control it and if I can't get what I want, then I want to own my own operation. And, uh, and that's basically uh, the decision he made is I think at the end, you know, and uh, this is, we're all postulating, uh, uh, these people are gone. And I hate to say that I really, I really liked Ray and, uh, and I, I liked Ann. I mean, uh, uh, geez, Lester's gone. They're, they're, uh, Paul Jones is gone. I mean, we're talking about history here, and and who who is going to really know what would have happened? But uh, I want to continue if with this uh, this what's happening with the NWA support, and uh, what's happening is Lester's company all of a sudden is beginning to outgrow the Atlanta Auditorium. The Atlanta Auditorium was always a big building. It was the big, the biggest uh, uh, revenue you were going to produce every week was going to be on Friday night in that auditorium. And now they're selling out. Not only is Lester selling out the auditorium, but she's selling out the auditorium on Tuesdays. I believe her night was Tuesdays. His night was Friday. That's unheard of. It's just unheard of to have competition between two wrestling organizations and both of them being doing that well. But now Lester is beginning to win the battle. He's got uh, Watson there doing the booking. He's, he's, he's added people to his, his card. And then he starts to throw together. He decides, or Watts probably decides, this is Watts's thinking uh, probably is we're, let's look at the Omni. The Omni is this big, beautiful building downtown Atlanta, holds uh, 16,000 people. Uh, now they're drawing about 8,000 or a little bit more maybe in the auditorium. And Watts wants to see this thing pop. And uh, I think he has part of the company, and that's probably why he wants to see, the, see it pop. He's going to make more money on his end that way. And they run a card. And this card to me, Brian, is just I'm going to spend a few minutes on this card. Uh, it's just absolutely unbelievable, this card. They ran on June the 1st, 1973 in the Omni. They did, they, they did 16,500 fans. Uh, and uh, it's a perfect example of why Lester is winning the battle and why he's going to win the battle. Uh, this is the card, and I kind of went through and did my – history and then and to find out where all these guys come from okay uh so on that night june 1st 1973 16,500 people bearcat brown opens up with sputnik monroe bearcat brown comes out of tennessee sputnik monroe comes from florida bobby duncan comes from amarillo and the funks 
against Bill Dromo, who comes from Tennessee. Ramon Torres comes from Kansas City against, and he wrestles Stan Vachon from Montreal. Uh, the Southern Heavyweight Championship, Buddy Colt from Florida, wrestles my brother Rob, who is a now wrestling in Georgia at this point. Uh, NWA World Junior title, Danny Hodge from Oklahoma, works against Bob Orton Jr. from the Carolinas. U.S. Heavyweight Championship, The Sheik from Ohio, wrestles Bobo Brazil from Indianapolis Territory. WWWF World Championship, Pedro Morales from Vince McMahon Sr. in New York against Paul Jones out of the Carolinas. Mr. Wrestling 1 and Mr. Wrestling 2 from Georgia versus Jack Briscoe from Florida and the Georgia heavyweight champion Bill Watts. Georgia Tag Team Championship, Eddie and Mike Graham from Florida against the Georgia champions, the Infernos with J.C. Dykes. The main event is Bob Armstrong, the Georgia talent, versus Bobby Shane out of Florida for a Cadillac. Wow. How do you, how do you, where? If, if that isn't one of the greatest cards of all time, I did. You got to show it to me. Certainly seems like one of the biggest ones of that era for sure. The Cadillac. We spent a lot of time talking about that, obviously, in the past. Who would have done the Cadillac final or the Cadillac tournament at this time in Georgia that would have seen your father do it in the past? Uh, I think Lester. Uh, Lester, Lester uh, has Lester has won one in Jacksonville, Florida. A Cadillac tournament uh, years back uh, when he was wrestling in Florida, and he understands the concept of it. Now, basic, ba what you have to bear in mind is this Cadillac tournament has been going on for quite a while. This is not just a one-night affair. This has been going on a while. It's down now to Bob Armstrong as a finalist against Bobby Shane in the finals. So they're giving away the car that night. So uh, this is just, to me... Uh, Gosh, it's just a phenomenal card. It's uh, it's it's staggering. I, I've never seen anything like this. So, uh, you know, and so now what happens is their their impact is phenomenal. Uh, she's she's got to be realizing at this point that wow, I'm I'm not going to be able to compete with this. Uh, she's still got Ox Baker. And she still got uh, the assassins, and she still got the the crew that was there, basically, uh, considerably eight months, six eight months uh, earlier. They're still there, and when she goes on TV to advertise her card, and he's gone on TV to advertise this card. Uh, if I'm a wrestling fan, uh, wh where am I going to go? I think I would go with the big card with all the people that I've seen in wrestling magazines, past stars from the territory, because by this point with Ann's promotion, you've been seeing the same guys for months with very few new guys added into the mix. Yes. Yes. And I, and I think that's a, uh, that's, that's exactly what they're seeing. And uh, so, so she, they are, they are beginning to really uh, leap forward. And and she's beginning to drop back. Uh, so now I come to my part again, about a year after that first appearance there, in which I go and talk to her and try to talk her out of staying in business. Uh, so uh, Bill Watts is a uh, he's he's ready to leave Georgia. He's about to leave Georgia and he's going to come to Florida. And when he comes to Florida, he's going to light it up. Uh, he's going to turn dusty baby face. Uh, he's going to. Florida's going to explode in 74, uh, just explode in 74. Uh, he's already getting it done there in Georgia. But uh, he, he is, he's the Georgia heavyweight champion. He's been that champion for a long time. Uh, when Lester goes to him, though, and he's about to leave, he's thinking about leaving, uh, and Lester says, well, uh, you know, we need you to drop the belt, uh, and we'd like to put the belt on wrestling, Mr. Wrestling number 2, Johnny Walker who is over at this point there in Atlanta. He is really rocking him. And, uh, and Watts uh, doesn't like wrestling, too, for whatever reason. I don't know that. I don't know what the reasoning is, but Watts says, no, I, I, won't, I won't put two over. Uh, so 
they, they, then, then Lester tells me, or Roy tells me that this, this little thing goes on for a few weeks with, with Watts. And, and Lester keeps saying, well, who will you do this with? Who will you do this with? And, uh, so in November of 73, he, he finally pins, pins, um, Watts down. Watts is going to leave in a, in a few more weeks. And, and Watts says, uh, I'll put the belt on Ron Fuller in Florida. Uh, I had never met Bill Watts in my life. I had no idea this was going down in Atlanta. I didn't know I was in any conversation or anything else. I have no idea why Bill Watts selected me uh, because I'm in Florida at that time. Maybe he thinks I'm a pretty good talent, and I am beginning to get a bigger name. And so he says, I will put Ron Fuller over. Uh, so he starts working an angle to get ready to bring me in so that the match is meaningful. Uh, he starts working an angle with Rob and Rob has been there for quite a while now. Robson pretty decently over there himself. Uh, now watch is a sharp booker and he, he works several matches in which he puts a match together in which he wrestles Rob. And he says, you're, you're the son of a wrestler and, uh, you know, and you've been pushed and you really don't have that much talent kid and I'll beat you in 10 minutes or I'm going to give you there's a significant amount of cash. Is a is two or three thousand dollars. If I can't beat Robert Fuller in ten minutes, I'll give him a certain amount of money. Now, I don't know what the amount of money was, but it's a pretty decent little angle. And Rob manages. They work around the territory with that, and he even does it with Rob on TV. And he doesn't beat Rob because Rob runs. <laughs> Rob just avoids him as much as he can till he gets to that 10 minute time limit. And by the time Watts has about got him, the bell rings and Watts has to cough up the money. Now this goes on for a couple of weeks there. And, uh, so when I come in to wrestle, uh, what the Watts books me on December 14th, 1973, he puts me on the card with hero Matsuda. Now, I'm about 20 pounds heavier than I was a year earlier than that, and then quite a bit more muscular. And uh, and I've been St. Louis. I've been in uh, New York City. I've been all over. I'm becoming a pretty decent wrestler at this point. And, uh, and I think Watts is aware of that. So uh, he puts me with Hero. And obviously, Hero and I got great history. I've worked with Hero many times. Uh, I'm come back um, after the Australia and everything else. I'm a much better worker than I was before. Uh, we've spent time together in the snake pit. We go out there and tear the house down in Atlanta because we we've had that history and 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 we do a lot of wrestling uh, because that's Hero's style. He's just that type of worker, even as a heel. Uh, so and and Hero puts me over. Uh, so then Watts comes out in the main event with Rob and he has another one of these matches again in which he's putting time limit against money, you know, uh, and real quickly in the match, he gets Rob bleeding and Rob bloody as heck. Uh, I'm watching the match up there on the stage and Rob's bleeding like crazy. And, uh, at the end of the match, Watts is about to beat him and, and I slide down to the ring and, I trip him or whatever it is, and Rob don't. Rob doesn't actually uh, keep the win the money by doing the time limit. Rob actually beats him. <laughs> he gets pinned. Watts gets pinned by Rob because I interfere in the match. Uh, so as soon as the match is over, Watts gets up. He's a he's just uh, livid. I mean, he's screaming and he got the microphone and he's saying, you know. Uh, I want you, kid. I want you, Ron. I want you, the big brother, you know. And uh, so I say, okay, well, you make it a championship match. I'll I'll come back from Florida and take your butt, Watts. And, uh, oh, it's a big pop. Crowd goes nuts. And uh, obviously, they book that for the following week. I come in the next week. I wrestle Bill Watts for the Georgia Heavyweight Championship. He puts the title on me. Uh, two weeks later, I come back. I wrestle Mr. Wrestling too. Uh, I put the belt on him. And uh, uh, by the end of 1973, there's a lot of changes uh, getting ready to take place in Atlanta. Uh, now Jim Barnett is uh, thinking about leaving Australia. Uh, Jim Barnett's an extremely wealthy guy. 
Uh, he has run great businesses all over. Uh, everywhere he's ever been has been hugely successful. Uh, he knows what Ted Turner's television is all about, and he is ready to commit the dollars that it's going to take to be able to end this war. He's going to single-handedly end the wrestling war in Atlanta, and he's going to do it by uh, coming in, buying Lester out, and then he's going to buy Ann Gunkel out rather than just have her clothes away. I believe he does this. Now, I'm not absolutely sure, but I think he buys her out as well uh, because he's got a relationship with her. They go back a long way, and uh, obviously him and Lester go back a long way. And here is the – and there and later in, uh, in 1973, uh, early 74 – it's going to be the end of the wrestling war in Atlanta. This has been tremendous, Ron. And I have a feeling the listeners are going to have lots of questions about this. At some point, we may have to do a questions episode just about the wrestling war in Atlanta because there's so much to talk about. But as we wrap things up here, we want to remind everyone, you can become friends with the Tennessee Stud on Facebook, the page, Ron Fuller, the Tennessee Stud. You can follow the Tennessee Stud on Instagram and Twitter at Ron Fuller Welch. You can follow me on Twitter at Great Brian Last, you can hear me each week on the 605 Super Podcast at 605pod.com or available wherever it is that you find your favorite podcast. You can visit the Tennessee Studs website, tnstud.com, for every single episode of the Studcast, as well as the Super Studcast, the rest of the story, Tennessee Studs souvenirs, and so much more, tnstud.com. And on the topic of the Super Studcast, Listen to the hottest one out there, the three-hour bone-chilling Super Studcast number nine, Wrestling Riots, as well as the rest of the Wrestling Riot story available right now to all patrons at tnstud.com or patreon.com slash studcast. If you enjoy this show, consider becoming a patron of the show. For only $3, you get so much extra content each month. Ron, as we wrap things up, where are we going next week? Well, Brian, you know... I kind of had an idea of where we were going, but you had a great suggestion there. I mean, we've spent two programs. Uh, I think we've really dealt in depth with the subject of the Atlanta wrestling war. And maybe uh, rather than leave the subject now, I uh, might never come back to it because I'm working chronologically. Uh, why don't we just next week give the fans an opportunity? I will go on to my Facebook uh, and uh, they can contact me through Twitter uh, if they want to leave questions there. And if they want to leave, fans want to leave questions about this Atlanta wrestling war or maybe something I haven't covered, something I've said that, uh, that they have thoughts about, uh, would like to hear more about, whatever, why don't we just do another episode and let's, for the first time ever, have fans give them the opportunity to – to finish the wrestling war themselves and, and, and send their, their questions to us. And let's answer, let's answer them next week. I think that's a tremendous idea. Again, if you are friends with the Tennessee stud on Facebook, stay tuned for a post and you can post your questions there. And if you're a member of my group, the mothership, same thing, we'll take your questions as well. But until next time, remember Ron Fuller Studcast is a production of the Arcadian Vanguard podcast network for the Tennessee stud, Ron Fuller. I'm the great Brian last. The story continues next week.